Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our study. Sorry, we're starting a bit late today, but um, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we are so thankful uh, for each of the people who have come to these studies over the past couple of years. We know that some are with us still, and many have joined, but some are no longer with us uh, for various reasons. We just ask, Lord, that um, your angels can watch over each person, that you can speak to them, and that they can hearken. Lord, you understand how frail humanity is, and that we need your strength and your understanding in order to address the things in our lives and to face the problems that exist around us. And so we invite your Holy Spirit uh, to be here once again in our studies and that we can um, continue to have light for our feet. We pray for one another again, Lord, and uh, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be here in our midst. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning again, everyone. So yesterday we were looking at uh, this line of Jeroboam, and we we had a fair bit of discussion um, regarding the darkness and and the the messages of these lines. Um, so the line of Jeroboam, of course, uh, is going to begin at eleven nine two thousand nineteen and end on December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. And the line of Gideon uh, will do the same thing. Now, in formulating this line of Jeroboam, we um, we could see that the 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 darkness is um, related to Parminder's message, but it's it's a little bit more. Um, It, it, it's it's creeping into our history in what way? So what what is this darkness that we see in this line of Jeroboam? I'll show you the line. And, and we're going to look at these verses that express this. So because it's Jeroboam, I argued that, that the time of the end here is uh, related to this altar uh, being torn down. And um, then the name that is given to Gideon, Jeroboam, that this has to do with this um, time of the end marking. Now, if this name is given to Jeroboam, it's given in a sense in a mocking way, right? So how would this relate so, because we're going to put the verses here at this time at the end, the arrival of the first angel's message. Um, so, if we're saying that this is the renaming of Gideon to Jeroboam, and we look at this line that we have chosen based on these waymarks, that this has to do first with the proclamation of the Nashville prediction, and then with the failure of that prediction and the response. Um, and the light that's that's going to come from that. Um, so so let's talk about this this naming of Jeroboam. So so Gideon being renamed. How could that be the time of the end? And what what parallel is that? What does that mean that he's named Jeroboam? Anyone with thoughts? Okay. <clears throat> is, is this sarcasm being directed at Gideon or is it being directed to those around him? Well, it's being directed to those around him. Right? Right. So, so Gideon is, he's doing what's right. Uh, his father notices that, right? He gives him this name and he's directing it at those that have have 
question why he tore down this altar of Baal, right? Correct. And and so he gets this name, let Baal plead. And um, so this, do we have some parallel that we could use to say that this is the time of the end? Because we're going to put it at this way mark, which is 11.9. And so, so if we're saying that this is the time of the end, this is the arrival of the first message, do we have any precedence to do so? <clears throat> well... I think we have quite a bit of precedence during the Millerite time frame, and we may even have some that we could apply directly from the history of the Adventist Church. Okay. Now, one of the points of this study has become the the need for us to recognize chronological waymarks as they apply during the time that, that we are currently living. Okay. Over the last few days, I've been made aware of pastors speaking from the pulpit that are making comments that the end of time is the end of prophetic time. Yeah, so when we get to the time of the end, there's no more prophetic time. Right. That's the idea. Yeah. And, and it's a misquote of spirit of prophecy, by the way. Exactly. And yes. telling the, the, the people to whom they are speaking, as an Adventist, giving you dates for future events beyond October 22nd, 1844, you are to bless that person and pay just as little attention as possible, that you are not to give any heed or any mind to those that are giving an inner relation to what is currently going on. So that we can't see any event presently happening as a fulfillment of prophecy. Correct. So at this point, as we're pointing out on this line, we... Brother Dwight. Yes, brother. Um, could you repeat? I didn't understand that last part you said about that. In a relationship of what? Okay. What I'm, what I'm stating, brother, is that right now we have a great interrelationship with what we are seeing happen today as we can see from the history that occurred during the Millerite time and in specific portions of Adventist history. Right now, <clears throat> to consider a point, from 1881 to 1884, we had two leaders of the church, one general conference president, one the, the party that was teaching all of the future pastors and administrators of his time that were saying, A, portions of the Bible can be safely discounted, and on the other hand, that the testimony of Sister White means nothing. And those that are following this are deluded. Now, when a pastor is trying to tell people that we shouldn't pay attention to prophecy, that we should not worry about this, because there is no more prophetic time after October 22nd, 1844. 
then we are hearing people telling others it's okay to go back to sleep. You don't have to concern yourself with what's going on. I am a trained theologian. I understand these things better than you. So just rest. You don't have to worry about these things that are going on. These kind okay, of. I just didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I didn't. I understand now what you're talking about. I apologize. Don't apologize. I, I, you know, I have okay. no issue answering a question like this. We're all here to learn. So one of the things when we looked at this line, um, and we're going to look at Angela's comment here pretty soon too. So when we when we looked at this line here in the line of Gideon, um, for the three different uh, chapters, basically we took three different lines, um, and this this part that we're addressing here is this name change. We didn't really address it in any of these lines. That is, we, um, just trying to find it here. Uh, so, can't find it, so, let me see here. Um, Okay, so it so when it says, therefore, on that day he called him Jeroboam, saying, "Let Baal plead against him, because he hath throw down his altar." Um, when we were looking at these lines itself, um, you know, we don't really uh, address it. I mean, we have Judges six twenty seven, so that gave us June twenty seventh. So we're going to go to. Uh, what Angela was saying. And it's going to be in verse 32, right? So we don't address all of the verses, um, but we put verse 34, um, when the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, he blew the trumpet and Abiezer was gathered after him, right? So, so we have, the point that I'm trying to make, I guess, is we have all of these different symbols in the story of Gideon. Like, Lots and lots of symbols. And we could create multiple lines. That is, we could take each one of these way marks and create a line, right? Just like we can with any line. We can take a way mark and expand upon it. Now, we chose to, to look at these three major lines in the story of Gideon um, because they address particular issues in this movement as we look at the development of our lines. So for instance, in the line of Gideon, you're going to have this, and this was fairly important, that we took November 9th, 1989, and we marked this point in which we have this prophet, which is Jeff's message, coming up to September 11th, 2001. And then we could see that that paralleled November 9th, 2019, and that, that that's the arrival of this first message. Now, we know, of course, in, in our bigger line, November 9th, 1989 is the time of the end. It's the arrival of the first angel's message. But now when we look at the line of Gideon, we know that we're zoomed into this movement, into this, to this fractal of everything that's happened or that's going to happen. Right. So it's it's summing up all of this history. And we look at September 11th, 2001 and November 9th, 2019, and we say. The second angel arrived on September 11th. 
And the story of the judges is always zoom into the second angel arriving. But here in the line of Gideon, we can see that November 9th, 2019 is that parallel. So, so FFA goes through this special history on November 9th, 2019. And, and then we could, we could see that chapter six is going to address that. And then when we look at chapter seven, it's going to go all the way back to September 7th, 2019 as a first angel arriving, because it's going to address another point about this movement. And then when we go to chapter eight, we go back to, we, we move up to, I guess, July 19th. And we see that there's a line addressed there, another particular issue, right? So, so in trying to, to understand this, for somebody who is, is going to be looking at what we present at the camp meeting, we know wheels within wheels. It appears complicated, but the more we study it, the more we start to see uh, the order, the organization that exists within these lines. And now we know that the line can go all the way down to the individual and even to events in the individual's lives, right? So, so we all have a part in these lines, in a part that we have played. And some of, some of those, those events in our life are way marks in the lines themselves. Some of those are just way marks in our own life, but they, but they, but they parallel what we see happening in the movement. So this is the basic understanding that we have. But now we have to sort through this. And, and what we are doing is we're saying that when we go through a story in the book of Judges or anywhere in scripture, that there are symbols that we, we use to recognize that this is a waymark and to place that waymark correctly. And so these symbols are important. But the other part of it is we do need to recognize what the message is. And, and I'm not sure that I fully understand this line of Gideon um, because of its complexity. Um, as, we've, as we study into each of these lines, they in a sense become more complex, right? As we understand them better, we start to see the complexity of it. So the point that I'm trying to make here, when we, when we address this, and so let's look at what Angela says. So in the chat, um, she looks at 622. So we're going to come back to this naming here. Um, so in Judges 622, when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. So we're going to place that at June 22nd. So when we look at the line of Gideon in chapter six, we're going to say that's when international attention was drawn to this movement because of the publication in the Tennessee and the day before, right? So, so we marked 622 in that line. And then, um, so this is Snow's letter on Pentecost as well, right? So June 22nd, he writes this letter in 1844, and then it's going to be published on June 27th. Now, of course, this has this interesting uh, fact that June 27th is the 11th day of the third month, and if you double it, you get 622. Um, so that was one of the things that was interesting. Um, and then, so the judges six. 27, Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. So it was because he feared his father's house and the men of the city that he could not do it by day. He did it by night. So this is going to be um, tearing down the altar, right? So he did, first thing he's going to do is he's going to uh, do an offering. 
right? So he's going to do this offering that the Lord directs him to do. And okay, so I, I'm just trying to read this here and, and figure out exactly where the Lord tells him to tear down the altar. But uh, yeah, um, and, and throw down the altar of Baal. That's in verse 25, that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. So first he's going to, he's being told to build an altar and offer these offerings, but he's also being told to tear down this, this altar, this other altar to Baal. And he's going to take 10 men of the city uh, to do that, to help him, right? So, so when we looked at the line of Gideon in chapter 6, uh, we have these way marks there, right? We can see that there's a formalization of the message. And then we have June 27th. Now, June 27th is 21 days before July 18th. Um. Now, so we have July 18th, and we put Judges uh, 6.34 there. But I think, actually, we, we should have Judges 6.32 there at the second angel arriving. Now, would a, na a name change relate to an arrival of a message is the question. So I know this has been roundabout to get there. Well, we've accepted that a name change is a symbol of entering into a covenant relationship. Right. And and so there is a covenant made there at July 18th. Right. July 18th is the arrival of this second message in that line. And now we put um, that there's this trumpet blown. That's why I chose verse 34, Judges 6 verse 34, um, but I don't know if that's the best verse. I mean, we could say Judges 6, verse 32 to 34. I mean, we were usually picking some of these verses because of the symbolisms of the numbers themselves to, to mark that way mark. But I think the name change is that, that, in a sense, on July 18th, we enter into covenant, right? That's the name change is there. And, and even when you look at what we're predicting, which is the destruction of this uh, temple in Nashville, um, I mean, that's relating to the destroying of the altar, but he gets this name change. And do we have... Um, you know, we have a mocking there in a sense with this name change, but what we did was correct, right? Even though there's this criticism, agreed. Okay, so can we change that then uh, to Judges six thirty two, and then what I would put here is a name change. So you understand what, I, what I'm trying to, to establish here about this line, that we have this name change here in this line. But we're going to say that, that, this, that this line, chapter 6, is, is really about November 9th. where we're going to put the time of the end in this, this other line. That is, this line here is a zoom into, so even though we have chapter 6 and we did that first, when we look at this line here of Jeroboam, that this line is addressing that name change. This is a line addressing a covenant. And what is the covenant that is being made at 11.9 and also on July 18? 
So I'm having a hard time expressing myself because there's just too many ideas here. But if we're looking at this line of Jeroboam, and this is representing our movement, it's representing what Angela has placed there, is this is this covenant that we have made in tearing down the altar of Baal and, and, and also offering this symbolic sacrifice to God that God had directed us to offer. Is, is that making sense to people then? And some thoughts on that, if anybody has thoughts on that. I think you've you've put together the bare bones of this. And that there's probably quite a bit more to address in the way that you're proceeding. Okay. So so we're saying that this Jeroboam is a name change. It represents a covenant. And 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 so if we're going to set up this line, would we put the name change at the beginning, the arrival of the first angel's message. Are we going to use that verse to start this line? Or are we going to um, use, use, do it some other way? You understand what, I, what I'm saying? So... We want to use a verse to start this line. Now, we, we're saying that this has to do with the covenant. Now, when we talked about the darkness here, and we looked at this message, this is about the proclamation to Nashville, right? Because we're going to see these waymarks, the publication in the Tennessean, July 18. And then the result of the failure of that prediction, what that meant. And FFA is being tested in this first part. And another group is being tested. And, and the question is what we're being tested about to some degree is, is the July 18 prediction. And the July 18 prediction is in response to uh, a misuse of chronology, right? So one of the things we looked at was this ephod, right? which we're, we're not particularly addressing here. But it's going to be the result of not accepting these messages. That is, if we do not understand what God has revealed to us, just like in Millerite history, when we get to October 22nd, 1844, and we're going to say that that's December 25th, 2021. If we're not benefited by those those two messages, we're going to reject this third message. And this third message that arrives, I mean, there are different messages that arrive on December 25th, 2021, because it, there are many lines that we have that end there. But in this particular line, it's going to be an understanding of what God was teaching us by this proclamation. Why we even got into time setting at all. Now, we got into time setting because of Parminder. I mean, to a large degree, in the way that we were doing it. Now, we always had time in the movement. And, and this is the thing that Parminder used to beguile Jeff. He's like, well, you already have time. We've, we've been using time and symbolic numbers and all these things all along. And, and so Parminder was correct. But he, he, he didn't understand why that was happening. Or at least he wasn't taking into an account why God was using time in this movement. And he believed that, that God was using time in this movement 
or at least he presented that. Whether he believed it or not, we don't know. He could have just used time as a way to can take over the movement to have his agenda fulfilled. So we don't know what his motives were. But we do know that they really haven't followed through on, on the basis for why we even set time in the first place, other than his argument. So his argument came down to dispensationalism. So Parminder just believed we're in a different dispensation. And, and he used it. He used time to actually undermine the whole foundation of this message. And the foundation of this message, I mean, it goes all the way back to Adventism and even all the way to the time of Christ, all the way to the beginning. But we could see that in his dispensationalism, he rejects basically Adventism, you know, everything that we would believe as Seventh-day Adventists. You know, Ellen White is just a woman who's writing in the 19th century, and so her beliefs are just reflecting that history and time. I mean, that's what I grew up in the United Church of Canada with, you know, the idea that Jesus just wrote and said the things, or he didn't write, but he said the things he did, and the disciples wrote that, or people later wrote this. And these are just the ideas that people had back then. Right? So, so we shouldn't take them too seriously. When we have an account of Jesus acting as if uh, Jonah and Noah and people in the Old Testament actually existed, that's just because he believed they did, because he's a Jew in the first century AD. Of course, he's going to believe those things, right? So these, this is the type of thinking that, that Parminder has. So if we're trying to understand this covenant that God has wanted to enter into with this movement, if we're, if we're going to look at uh, the story of Abraham, for instance, uh, so when we went through the lines, we had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. We had first, second, third angel's messages, and then the fourth, right? That's the basic line we had with those four. Now, where is the covenant being made, this trick question, in, in that history? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Where is the covenant? Where does God enter into covenant? As in location, or, or how are you referring to this? When? When does he enter into covenant? What story? Remember, it's a trick, trick question. Well, Genesis 15 is another example of the covenant, but doesn't he offer the covenant to Abraham well before that? Right. So so we see it at, at least in Haran. So it, it's implied in Ur because God calls him and talks to him. But it's really marked at Haran that he, he first is formally given this covenant. Uh, but then we're going to see that in, in chapter 15, it's repeated, right? It's going to be repeated again with um, uh, the promise of Isaac. And it's going to be repeated again, um, well, with the promise of Isaac and circumcision, right? So circumcision is going to be the sign of the covenant. Right? So we're going to get, he's going to get circumcision in uh, uh was it chapter? Seventeen, right? Genesis seventeen, is that what it is? Yeah. So so he's gonna he's gonna these three times, if you can look at it, Haran um in chapter fifteen, you know, when he's going to uh, have the animals cut in half. 
And then in chapter 17, he's going to have this covenant, right? So you have an arrival of a message, you have formalization, you have an empowerment. Um, and then it's, and then you have chapter 22, and that's when he's going to sacrifice Isaac, right? So after he has this promised seed, we're going to see that this happens on the third day. He's going to, Uh, get to this to this mountain, right? And there's this whole situation with Isaac and the wood and the lamb, and, uh, the ram, I guess, right? So there's all this stuff that happens. So we can see that there's there's just in that in the story of Abraham, there's four different places. And we could we could say, well, it's when he first is called, or we could say when it's it's ratified, right? We're gonna have. Christ walking between these carcasses in symbolic, symbolically. And then, well, you're going to have the circumcision. So that's the covenant. Or he's offering up Isaac. Now, does God make covenant with, with Isaac? Does he make covenant with Jacob? Does he make a covenant with Joseph? Yes. Right. So, so the question of where is the covenant? Well, it's in a three-step testing prophetic message is the everlasting gospel. Gospel. The everlasting gospel is the covenant that God makes with man. But then you're pointing even further beyond the events of, say, Haran. Mm -hmm. You're also pointing at the events in Eden. Right. So... So that covenant, this, the, the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. You know, that covenant there. So, so we have these covenants, right, all through the Bible. And with Abraham, I mean, he's going to have his name changed. Now, when does he get his name changed? Abram has his name changed just before the conception of Isaac. Well, and it's going to be in connection with the circumcision. Just after the circumcision. Well, it's in uh, it's in chapter 17, which is uh, dealing with the circumcision, right? Right. So Abraham was 90 years old and nine, and the Lord appeared to Abram saying unto him, I'm the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham, Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shalt thou thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I'll make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of kings of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. I'll establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Right. So when we look at this, this name change, I mean, there's different ways in which we can place this on a line because we can look at these covenants as the first, second, and third angel's messages, and then the offering of Isaac as a fourth, we can also just take them as the first angel arriving, the, the, the first angel formalized, it's empowered at the circumcision, and then um, the second angel arriving with the offering of Isaac, right? So it can be placed at the empowerment of the first angel the naming of Abraham. Now, when you deal with um, Jacob, you know, because Isaac doesn't get his name changed. But when you deal with, with Jacob, what's the conditions where his name is changed? We should know this. He's going to wrestle with this angel, with Christ. 
Now, his name, Jacob, which means a supplanter, right? It's the same as the name James. I don't know how you get James out of Jacob, Yaakov, to get uh, James, but... Um, so his name is going to be changed to Jacob, or from Jacob to Israel, because he prevails against God, right? That is, he will rule as God, right? That's what his name literal, literally means. So he's going to be, for he says, for he said, thy name shall be called no more uh, Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. <clears throat> now, um, it's going to be interesting, too, when Jacob gets his name changed, uh, he's going to ask of God's name, which is kind of interesting. But where would we place, in, a, in the line of Jacob, where would we place this story of him wrestling with the angel and getting his name changed? Because we, I don't know if we address that particularly. We did deal with the line of Jacob. Right, but I don't think we've really addressed it that specifically. No, because we weren't getting that specific in these lines, right? But if we're going to look at Jacob's life, I mean, uh, as a line that he would have, um, it definitely would be... Um, not at the beginning, right? So I'm looking at these lines that we did before, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham's line, I'm looking at Noah. So I don't even know if we got into detail regarding Jacob's personal line, right? Um, now we had Jacob, the story of Jacob dealt with the third angel's message arriving. Um, and so, yeah, there's, I'm just looking through here. So, lines. so we never even really address the line of Jacob, but if we think about Jacob, I mean, we know that there's going to be lots of events in his life, right? I mean, he's going to obviously first be born and he's going to have this contention with, with his brother Esau, you know, just in the birth itself, right? And then there's going to be this conflict and, you know, between them seeking for the favor of the dad, right? And of course, Esau is going to be the dad's favorite. And then we have, you know, his mother getting involved. He's going to deceive his father. We also have the story, of course, where Esau sells his uh, birthright for a mess of pottage, you know, so from let for a bowl of lentils. Right. Jacob is gonna flee, right? And <clears throat> and in that story of Jacob, um, you know, he's he's going to flee and he's gonna go to Laban and then he's gonna himself be deceived. <clears throat> right so there's and, and he's going to have that dream earlier when he flees uh from esau initially right because of deceiving his dad he's going to have the dream about the angels ascending and descending on this ladder which of course it is christ so i mean there's tons of stories there's tons of waymarks or stories within the story of Jacob uh, that we could place waymarks. We haven't done it. 
<clears throat> so we, we so we didn't place where his name changes. But if we were going to try to say what his name change is as a waymark, because we don't have a line even to put it in. But what is it? What is the name change for Jacob? He's going to wrestle. This is going to be near the end of his, his line to some degree, though he's going to eventually, um, you know, uh, go into Egypt as well. And there's going to be lots there. But in this story of his overcoming, uh, where would we put the time of Jacob's trouble on the line? Because he's going to wrestle with this angel and he gets a name change. So where, where would we place that? It's either going to have to be at the arrival of the second angel or at the end. Okay, so like the empowerment, maybe. Correct. Okay. And, and that's generally where I would place it is at an empowerment, right? So, I mean, we're going through all this because we're trying to think it through. We want to get it correct. Um, now, so I was saying that we, we have this altar of Baal then and and we could say because we have this period of darkness this period of darkness is addressing this false worship right a wrong way of studying god's word and now god's going to bring us through this experience this movement through this experience of making a prediction a time prediction having it fail and then having to address the aftermath of its failure right In, in this line of Jeroboam. That's, that's what we would see here. So, I mean, if we're going to have, have a name change, um, we, we probably would put it at July 19th then, wouldn't we? Because I'm saying that, you know, this is going to be the first May, but it, it, it's at least going to be July 18th or July 19th. Not 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 eleven nine. So so eleven nine would have to be where uh, we have this this message, an angel coming down and telling him to do something. So what if we took eleven nine is this angel telling him to to offer up an offering? And June 21st and 22nd is the offering. And July 18th is the tearing down of the altar. And, and maybe July 19th, the name change. Does that seem reasonable? Yes, it does. Okay. So that's going to be just that first part. So we're saying this is the line of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam has this experience uh, in which, that's Gideon has this experience, in which he becomes named Jeroboam. Okay. So maybe what we could do with this line. Um, so let's go over to here to the scriptures. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at, he's called Jeroboam, but he's not always called Jeroboam. So let's look at these verses themselves. So we know that he's going to be called Jeroboam first in Judges 6.32. And, and we're going to say then, well, either this is, you know, July 19th or July 18th or something in connection with, with that 
because all of this happens before. But we're not putting it at November 9th, which is where I first suggested. Well, because we could just say this is all about Jeroboam. Now, in Judges 7, 11, or 7, 11, 7 verse 1, it says, then Jeroboam, who is Gideon. So he's going to be referred to as Jeroboam. And now when we deal with the 300 men, you know, we know this is about July 18th, but this seems to be more about the other line, the line of Gideon, because it says then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, right? So here, he's, this is actually more the line of Gideon. Now, he's going to be called Jeroboam again in chapter 8. Now, this is going to be mentioned then in the death of Gideon. So he's going to, it's going to be said, and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. And Gideon had threescore and ten sons and his, of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Now, now we could say that maybe, um, because this is just basically he's not named Jeroboam very often. So we have basically three times that we have Jeroboam mentioned in those three chapters. Well, we have first when he's named Jeroboam and in seven verse one, and then in Judges 8.29 and 8.35. So we have four times that Jer Jeroboam is mentioned. The name Jeroboam. Now it's also going to be mentioned in Judges 9, but that's in context of Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, right? Now, maybe we look at those things too, as far as understanding this line. I don't know. Do you see what I'm getting at here? That we're, we're creating this line of Jeroboam, and, and we're arguing that um, that this is first about Jeroboam getting his name and and then we have these events that follow and they're, they're addressing something to do with Jeroboam so with this name Now, that would be the death of Jeroboam. If, if, if we leave out chapter 7, because chapter 7 is going to be about the 300. And here, we don't see in this line that sorting of the 300. Right. Okay. What we see in this line is the name change. That is, name denotes character. But there's so this so this line of Jeroboam is addressing this whole line, these three chapters. And and we say that this first message is addressing what happens at the beginning. Right, when he's first called. Now July 18, you know, that in the story of Gideon, chapter 8, of course, that's going to be all about July 18. But now we have just the aspect of Jeroboam himself. So, so if we do that, then we're really going to skip chapter 7, as far as this line is concerned. Because it mentions Jeroboam, but, but, but he's Gideon. He's not Jeroboam in this context, in this line. So now the other way marks we have is, well, we have the second angel arriving. And if we look at Jeroboam, then, um, then we have FFA, right? So we say FFA is being tested. But now we're going to mark FFA is, is ending, right? And July 18 is after 
um, after that is July 19th. And so what group is being tested here? I mean, we could call them different things, but it doesn't matter what we call them. Who's being tested in this history from July 18, July 19 to December 25th, 2021? Because FFA is, is still existing there. It's going to be there December 6, 2020. And, and it's actually going to exist technically, I guess, for a while, but really not doing anything. So, you know, when Trump, basically when Trump loses to the Democrats at January 6th, FFA has nothing to say about it, right? You're not getting any messages out of them. Yeah, we, we've heard there, there was nothing whatsoever presented, correct? Okay. Like they're not going to look at any of that. They don't look at the bombing of Nashville. They don't look at January 6th. Um, they have after December 6th, they have a few studies, um, but generally they just, that's it. You know, uh, I think Guy does some studies, um, but they don't carry on, right? So, but we're saying that that Jerobel is a, re, a renaming, right? So, you know, of Gideon, and it has to do, of course, with a victory. He's tear, torn down the altar of Baal, and he gets this, this name, this new name. So what group is being tested with this new name? So if we're going to put the naming, you know, here, so I'm just going to move this a bit. Um, so we're going to say that the new name here is 632. So Judges 632. <clears throat> okay, so you have Judges 632, he gets a new name. And then we would look at... Um, how would we, what verses would we place here? So we're, we're saying that uh, he's going to tear down the altar of Baal and he's going to make a sacrifice. So those verses um, are going to start with, uh, so, I mean, the angel of the Lord appears unto him, but uh, he's going to give him this direction. Okay. Yeah. I'm not trying to be contrary. Okay, that's fine. But why are we looking at 632 instead of 622? Well, 622 is, um, so that's the one that says, when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, so 622 to me would be 11.9. Okay. Right? So this, it, this is he sees this angel of the Lord, right? This is this arrival of the first message. So for the first time, he sees um, who this is, right? Okay. And, and then in 624, um he's going to build this altar. Um, no, the, the reason that, that I'm asking the question. Yeah. Larry, okay. Yeah. Is 612, 622, 632. We are seeing a progression. Yes, you are. So you're correct there. So 612. Um, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee. Thou all mighty man of valor then in 622 he's going to see that he saw the face of god right right and then in 632 um he's going to 
get this name change. Okay, so the reason I'm asking, yeah, in the way that that you've got six thirty two up there, where the way that that God is approaching this, the angel appears to Gideon and said, "The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor." Now, yeah. Gideon means what? Um, it uh, uh, it means like a warrior. Okay. Now, at the time of that appearance, Gideon's mind had been absorbed in meditations where he's concerned more about what's been happening in Israel and why the Lord is not there with them. Now, the angel comes before Gideon with a lot of warning, right? Yeah. Well, according to spirit of prophecy while Gideon's mind was absorbed in meditations like these suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to him mm -hmm. but without warning now all of these that are right now making these comments that anything prophetic should be ignored mm -hmm. If they're looking at a situation like this with Gideon, Gideon is having to recognize the fact that the children of Israel have not been keeping the law, but it comes as a surprise to those like Gideon that are considering the words of God. Okay. Now, we, in a way, are having to have the same experience as Gideon because we recognize that all of the lip service that's been being paid over the last many years by the church and by many of the members hasn't done any good because they the, the church as a whole has not been following the entire word of God. Okay. So the progression is you're, as you're pointing this out right now, 612 being the arrival of the first angel, the, for, the formalization being at 622, the empowerment at 632, and now we have the, this name change at 634. Right. So FFA is being tested. Right. Now we can see here there's a parallel uh, with this arrival of this message because that's uh, December uh, 6th, right? And and we know that December 6th, 2020, they're going to um, basically formalize their rejection of this test, right? Right. But also we know that 622, that's 12 6, that's 126. It's also... 216, 6 times 6 times 6, right? So it has these symbols. 622 is the symbol for FFA. And we're marking June 22nd there. Right. Now, now 632, um, you know, the number 632, 4 times uh, 518, I think, is, uh, um, so that's backwards, that's 815. But is, is 632. I don't know any significance of that number particularly, right? Um, so, but, but we have that verse. That's going to be the name change. And that's the empowerment. Or not the name change. Uh, yeah, that's the name change. And then 634 is um, the trumpet, right? 
So this is the new message, um, this, this call. Yeah, William? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I was reading and reviewing how this morning, the big green birds. And um, it came to a passage where it was talking about um, June 21st and June 22nd. Yeah. But there was... Where was that? I can't hear you, William. Okay, you might have. William, can you? Hello. So what year, June 21st and June 22nd? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's driving. Um, so somewhere Ellen White was talking about June 21st and June 22nd, or who was? Okay. Well, he's going to have to get back with us on that. But anyway, you see the point here with this uh, June 22nd and, and then this trumpet sound. So FFA is being tested in this history. So what are they being tested about then based upon the story of Gideon? Whether to trust God in all things. Hey, well, you're just a lot of static. We're going to have to come back to that. You could put it in the chat if you weren't driving with us, but. So we're going to have to get. Okay. So, so they're being tested. In the story of Gideon, it has to do with Baal, right? Right. We know this has to do with how we're studying. Right. Okay. Because because Gideon, he's he's sifting, you know, grain, right? By the wine press. So so he's trying to understand God's word. And and God's gonna come to him and uh, first reveal himself to him. And then he's going to recognize God's name, that, it, that it's God, right? He's going to publish the Nashville prediction. And then on July 18th, he's going to get his name changed from Gideon to Jeroboam. Right. And, and we can see how that, that would fit with July 18. We can also see that there's this, this progression of these verses. And then we get to this trumpet. So he gives this new message now on July 19th, right? And that new message that he gives um, when he blows this uh, trumpet, uh, the father of help is going to come to him, Abbey Ezer. So Ebenezer is going to gather after him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher, to Zebulun, to Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. Right. So, so this is this call. In this context, this isn't the call to give the Nashville warning. This is a call in this line to this movement, and. And we can see that in this movement, um, there's going to be this um, examination, basically, of this message, right? That's what's going to happen. But December 6th, it's a rejection of this message. So they do their examination. Right. And then on December 25th, because of the bombing of Nashville, we're awakened to an understanding of chronology that we didn't have 
before. That is, we weren't really applying, you know, after July 18th, we're not setting any dates. I mean, we do have Daniel Vanderhorst who's looking at some of the structure. But now we have something that solidly connects us to the Nashville prediction, that 187 days. Now, the movement that had rejected this light, they obviously aren't going to be benefited by this empowerment of the second message that we're saying that it is. So that there was a message given on July 19th that we were correct in our understanding of the time. So the time was correct. July 18th wasn't an incorrect date, but we didn't understand the event, right? What it meant. And then when we get to December 25th, 2021, the third message arrives. So our line is over, 777 days is over. And for some, there is a disappointment, right? That is this group that's being tested also during this period, who are they? Who's being tested from July 19th to December 25th, 2021? That's what we're gonna finish with here. We'll come back to this tomorrow, but can we give a description of who's being tested. How would how would you describe this group? Wouldn't we say that we are currently being tested? Okay, so who is we? Those that are choosing to study in the way that Father Miller would have us to study. Okay, those are the ones who are going to be victorious. But yeah, so, so I mean, you know, you could say it's the remnant of FFA, but that's not really that descriptive. In, in this line, he's going to call who? Who does he call with this trumpet blast? Who's going to be gathered unto him? Because he's going to send messengers throughout Manasseh. Right? And right. also Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. Right. So who are they? Would you say that they are the nation? They are the um, tribes around him. Okay, they're the tribes around him. So we got Asher; he's a, a son of Jacob through Zilpah. You got Zebulun; he's um, uh, the last of Leah's, right? The sixth. And then you have Naphtali; he's from Bilha, right? The second one of Bilha. And of course, you got Manasseh, right? That's the grandson, right? So that's going to be Joseph's son, but the one that, even though he's the oldest, he's going to become least. So one thing I guess we can say about each of these is... Um, So you got, so one of them is, of course, Leah's, but, and, you know, I guess you, you have all of them being represented. I mean, Manasseh is descended from uh, Joseph. But right? are any of them leaders of the children of Israel? No. But in a sense, they represent all of the descendants, all of the different you know, mothers, right? Because Manasseh is directly descended from Rachel, Zebulun, from Leah, and then you got Bilha and um, 
Zilpa, right? Both represented. So, so all the mothers are represented their, through their sons. So this is really a call to everyone, but it's not to the important ones. <laughs> it's to the least. Um, in some ways, you could say it's to uh, the remnant, the little remnant that are scattered abroad. Agreed. Okay. Um, you know, probably the best, the best one would be, uh, I like this one the best. The refuse. How's that? God does not make refuse. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but you can see that refuse, which is just another word for remnant. It's used in the scriptures. But it also are those that have been refused. Right? Those that have been cast out. Agreed. Okay. So that's why I like that word. Um, so those that really have been cast out, that they ha haven't been the ones that have been looked to. So they're going to be tested because FFA is going to cast them out. And, and they're really cast out. I mean, we could look at December 6th. That's just a formalization of them being cast out. But we know they're really cast out on July 19th, right? On July 19th, they really already decided. Uh, and they really even decided it before that regarding me. They really didn't want to have anything to do with with me and my chronology. But they're going to make a show of it that they're looking at this fairly. But they've already decided in their minds that they don't want anything to do with it. So that's who's being tested. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, so let's close. Remember to keep each other in, in our prayers. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow, but let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, um, thank you. As we have been uh, sifting through this grain, looking for, for precious wheat, for truths, but most of all, Lord, we pray for those who are searching, that they can be, uh, sifted, that we can be sifted, that you can see in us the image of Christ, that we can be precious grains of wheat. You know the sorrow we feel because you feel it even greater than we do when one soul is lost. And we pray, Lord, that we cannot be uh, the cause of that that we can cooperate with you in redeeming those that are lost. Forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in you. May your angels watch over us today. And may your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. We pray for the camp meeting coming up and the plans there. Uh, help us, Lord, as we seek to have time to figure these things out. Um, of what you want, of who's going to speak. We pray that you can provide the visas and the opportunities for those who want to be here, and that you want to be here. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.